Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist, integrative medicine specialist, and I'm here live and unscripted again because you wanted to learn about nerve blocks, and I'm going to demonstrate with my portable ultrasound on myself. It's connected to my phone, by the way, and you'll see actually what my nerves look like and the ones that we block for surgery. And more importantly, what do patients tell me when they're getting a nerve block? It's kind of interesting. And also what nerve blocks tell us about our body keeping score of past traumas. This is really fascinating. And so many of you have asked, I'm really happy that we're going to do it. And I'm going to do a little live demo on myself as well. This is my personal ultrasound. Um, I'm a big fan of it because I connect it to my phone and I have one of these foldy phones that I don't know why um, everyone thinks it's kind of crazy, but it's actually really helpful because I get a big screen for the ultrasound. So right off the bat, I'll just show you one of the most common nerve blocks that I do, and I'll tell you what I'm looking at while I'm doing it. So by way of intro, remember that a nerve block, also called a nerve blocker, is when we literally block your nerves, like when you go to the dentist's office and they numb nerves in your teeth, or really in your gums, alveolar nerves. But in the case of surgery, we block nerves in other parts of your body so that you don't feel the pain while you're under anesthesia and after you wake up. Because I promise, so you have to, I told you, I'd show you what the nerves look like. So here is my ultrasound on my neck right now. And to prove to you that it's me, not a recording, that's my carotid right there in the big, uh, that big circle in the middle. And I'm gonna make my jugular vein pop for you. So one, two, three. <laughs> so that's really me. It's not a recording of anything, okay? One of the nerves that is very commonly blocked for shoulder surgery is to the, I'm gonna bring the probe to the lateral side. And you're gonna see a couple of uh, little dots in the middle of the screen there. I wish I could point at them, but because of the situation here, I can't. I have plenty of videos that actually show what it looks like, but there's little dots that are where those nerves are that I block right there in the middle between two muscles. Those are called, called the interscaling nerve block. Those are C5, C6, C7. Uh, I would get a much better looking picture for you, but you get a rough idea. It's near some big arteries. You gotta move a little bit lateral to the side. And I actually use my phone with patients. I show them what those nerves are, and then I inject with a needle, and I'm going to show you right now, those nerves, I surround them with Novocaine-like medication. So uh, I'm going to show you the least scary one. This is a two-inch needle here. Now, I'm going to tell you the secrets about nerve blocks in a second, because we don't tell you what the implication is. This little catheter, well, this little needle here, you can see there's a tubing that we inject medication through to numb those nerves that I just showed you. The implication here is that when your nerves are numbed, all right, this is the, the most fascinating thing. No one ever talks about it. I'm numbing your nerves so that you don't feel pain. I might give you an oxygen mask, by the way. Everyone always asks me, like, am I awake when I'm doing this? Uh, you're, I give usually some sedation. I give you a little mask like this, maybe depending on how strong your lungs are, how sensitive you are to the anesthetic sedat sedatives. And when we numb those nerves, your brain never feels the pain. This is huge because we always say for any traumatic experience that the body keeps score. The body keeps score. Have you guys heard this before? This is, I know, I know you have because you've asked me to talk about this before. The body has a memory of pain. Whether that's emotional pain, psychological pain, physical pain, it appears that it doesn't matter as much as we thought it might. This is still an area of emerging research. So we don't know for sure to be very clear, but there is something called central sensitization and hyperalgesia and wind-up phenomena that refer to similar, not the same, physiological um, phenomena in the body, which relates to this whole concept. It's almost proof in some way that the body can keep score. By the way, a lot of people are saying here to hit the like button, Diana. <laughs> Thank you so much. As you know, I don't want to do product placement ever. I 
want to sell you on knowledge, if you will, that you have more power over your health. And we'll talk about even health for nerve blocks. You have more power over your health than you've ever been told. So you hitting the like button, sharing with others, subscribing helps me do this more often. The wind-up phenomena, central sensitization, they relate to experiences in your body where pain winds up your central nervous system, winds it up tight so that another stimulus that comes later might release a greater series of neurotransmitters that ultimately translates to more pain felt by the brain. We'll talk about this at a different session, but pain is 100% in the brain. Doesn't mean it's not real. It is very real, has very real physiological consequences, no question. But it is 100% in the brain. And we, we talked about this in other videos, and I'm going to do a whole session on this later on. But when we stimulate the body, we begin to wind up the central nervous system, no question. And when a subsequent stimulus comes, that might elicit more pain in the spinal cord tract up to the brain. And this has real consequences for my patients because now they might need more opioids and recovery than if they didn't have those pain sensations blocked. Now, how can pain sensation be blocked when you're under anesthesia? This is a whole, this is a fascinating topic, right? Because when you're asleep with anesthesia, you don't, remember what's going on, hopefully you're unconscious, but you, your body can still perceive painful stimuli because your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up. You might breathe rapidly, even though you're still unconscious because your brain is turned off. So you're not technically feeling pain because your brain is not online and the pain is in the brain. You can't be feeling pain, but, but very important here is that when your body receives that stimulus, and if your heart rate's going up, your blood pressure's going up, your respiratory rate is going up, when you wake up, you might, might, and we, we're still learning about this actively, you might have more pain afterwards because your central nervous system has been wound up so that future stimuli, so future painful stimuli are interpreted as more painful than they would have been previously. I, like I said, there's still a tremendous amount that we need to learn about this, but there is enough preliminary data out there and certainly personal experience that demonstrates that if we can do things like nerve blocks, like I showed you, this one just being one example for shoulder surgery. I'll show you another one in a little bit that I'll do for elbows or hands or other parts of the upper body. There's some for the lower body, some for the trunk. We do epidurals, as you know, for all sorts of abdominal surgeries and thoracic surgeries. But in general, if we can prevent the brain from seeing painful stimuli, either by nerve with nerve blocks, with intraoperative opioids, anesthetic gases, all of these have been shown to reduce the central nervous system being, like once again, wound up to be trigger happy to release more painful stimuli and ultimately painful messaging to your brain. It's a deeper concept than that, but this is the shared core of them. And some of these effects might persist for days, weeks, or months. We don't yet know. Probably for a number of hours is uh, what a lot of data suggests at this point, at this early point in our understanding of pain and the body keeping score. If that pain, in this case physical, that's felt, is not buffered with painkiller medications, with nerve blocks, et cetera, then the body keeps score and you'll feel more pain later on. Is the same true for emotional pain? Well, it appears yes as well. So if you, fascinating, we, we don't tell this to patients. I don't know why. We need to tell patients this more often. Let's say I'm doing a nerve block on you. I'm gonna show you a different bundle of nerves that we block. And this one's gonna be called the supraclavicular view. And I'll tell you why your mental health state. You actually see the gel on my neck there. Your mindset like appears to determine what's going on as well. Now, uh, if you, hold on, hold on, hold on. let me get a little bit more gel. The more anxious you are, as you're getting a nerve block, there's at least one study, I believe it was done, done in France, that showed that the effect of the nerve block, and the thing they were looking at, axillary nerve blocks, not this one, but we believe the same concept would likely hold. 
the more likely that nerve block was to not last as long. So when you're feeling emotional angst, by the way, you see the big thing in the center there that's pulsating? That's my, that's an artery there above my clavicle. And if you look on the where my finger is pointing, you see a bunch of little black holes. Those black holes represent the brachial plexus. And I would inject numbing medication right around there to also numb nerves that are not so much for your shoulder, but for the rest of your body. Now, if you're anxious at the time of me numbing those nerves, for reasons we don't understand, I'll share my suspicions, you are more likely to have a less effective nerve block. Nerve blocks last anywhere from 30 minutes an hour up to 24 hours. And in some cases, depending on the medications, up to three days. If they last up to three days, that's fantastic because you aren't going to need as many, if any, opioids during that time period. So typically anything that we believe can, I've got to freeze, there we go. I have to pause the ultrasound so it doesn't kill the battery there. Anything that we believe can reduce your opioid needs is certainly going to be beneficial because you're less likely to be nauseous, get constipated, have the risk of others in your household developing opioid use disorder. You yourself developing opioid use disorder. It only takes a couple of days, literally five, six days before your risk of opioid addiction increases after surgery. We need to tell patients about this. We need to explain how nerve blocks can, in some cases, be safe because they prevent the brain from potentially being wound up because it never received a painful stimulus in the first place. We call this preemptive analgesia. Preemptive meaning before, analgesia meaning pain reducing. The same can be said for preemptive therapy for depression or anxiety or PTSD that we know can get worse after surgery as well. Yet we don't tell patients about this because unfortunately, and I shared with you, we are so busy slapping oxygen masks on patients' faces, having them go to sleep, putting breathing tubes, and having them wake up again. And unfortunately, the reality, and that's why I'm here with you today and why I like to do this for you, because you need to know the truth, which is that we don't empower patients to take control over their bodies, over their health. We don't empower patients to advocate for themselves. And nobody will be a better advocate for your health than yourself. You knowing what a nerve block is. So <laughs> here's the story I wanted to tell you at the beginning. Multiple times a month, I have a patient who I've explained the whole nerve block process to. Usually we start the night before when I call them and I explain the whole process. I see them the next day. I re-explain the whole process because people forget. I totally understand. And then I give them the first bit of relaxing medication. And now for the first time, they've relaxed. And I put the ultrasound in this area here or wherever I'm doing the nerve block. And they say, what are you doing, doc? And I'm like, oh, we're going to do the nerve block. And they say, what's that? You didn't tell me you're going to do that. And this demonstrates a failure of our healthcare system. Now, I know that we discussed it. I'm not blaming the patient, but I am going to be honest about what environment are we letting patients be in, in a state of anxiety, in a state of, I mean, complete distraction. We're expected to do informed consent as we should be doing for patients. Yet if patients are not in an environment where they're comfortable to receive that information and to consent to it and actually know what they're consenting to, how is this fair to the patient? So it's only when I've given them a little bit of Versed or midazolam, a little bit of fentanyl for them to calm down as I do a nerve block. Now they're comfortable asking, wait, what is this thing again? We need to help patients be comfortable, be relaxed, be trusting in their doctor so they can ask the right questions. So they're less anxious when I'm doing the nerve block so we can optimize the chances of that nerve block lasting as long as possible to reduce their opioid use, uh, their opioid needs for as long as possible so that they can be comfortable <laughs> when they wake up so that we minimize the chances of them waking up with a triggering uh, experience for PTSD. <clears throat> maybe reducing their chances of emergence delirium. Certainly data in children supports that the more relaxed patients are falling asleep, pediatrics patients, the more relaxed they wake up. And the last thing you want is to wake up kicking, screaming, cussing, etc. How can we help patients be at ease and trusting 
and focused on what they're hoping to achieve with their surgery instead of treating them like a meatpacking factory. Like I said, slapping oxygen, pushing propofol, waking up. And over and over again, this isn't right for patients. And nerve blocks are just one example because they're a little bit out of the ordinary for most patients. It just, it's a complete knowledge gap. And unfortunately, too many patients are too scared to speak up and are too distracted and overwhelmed in an unfamiliar system. And I see the effect in my patients and I want patients to know that you can affect what happens to your body, even when you're under anesthesia, because the better we can help you before for, with preemptive, I'm going to say it again, preemptive analgesia, preemptive psychological therapy. How about just being compassionate and trusting preemptively instead of trying to gain the trust after you wake up from surgery? When the pain has been done, has been felt by the brain, even when you're unconscious, the body has kept score. Just like a child who has been abused in early adolescence or even early childhood, that adverse childhood experience appears to ingrain itself and mesh itself in one, not only one's identity, but also in their physical bodies in ways that can be fixed, of course, but they can't be fixed without the right inner and outer support. The inner support comes from knowledge and empowerment and advocating for yourself. I hope that you appreciate that you have more power over your health, even in the operating room, when you don't know what's going on to your body because you're unconscious, literally in a medical coma, but the body keeps score even in those most profound moments of your life and that you have power even when you don't know that you have power over your health. With that said, um, once again, if you appreciate what I talk about, we'll answer your questions in a minute, but do please hit that like button, share what you've learned with others. Your support helps me do this more often. Leave a comment about what you want me to talk about. And I do regularly ask in polls what you want to hear about because that knowledge is empowering and helping you advocate. Um, okay, a pain crisis after surgery asks Elizabeth. Well, a pain crisis can mean many, oh, asks, um, uh, where did it go? So many fantastic questions. Janie says, what's a pain crisis after surgery? Janie, I don't know what a pain crisis refers to because it means different things to different patients. A pain crisis in the sense of waking up with delirium because you are in so much pain and so disinhibited from anesthesia can be an example of a crisis where someone doesn't know what's going on. When you're in emergence delirium, you're inconsolable. You can be an adult, an adult, like grown... Um, I'll use good words here, a grown as heck adult, mature, wise, et cetera. And you can wake up completely kicking and screaming, unconsolable. It might be because the pain is overwhelming your body. It's like when you turn on the lights of a room, this is very powerful, right? If you walk into a dark room and you turn on the lights, it takes your eyes to adjust, right? It's like half a second or so or so before you can see everything. When your body gets overwhelmed with any stimulus, whether it's an addictive stimulus like an opioid or a, med, uh, a benzodiazepine, heroin, cocaine, whatever, it overwhelms your brain's ability to dial down the dopamine rush. The same thing for pain. That sudden onset of pain when you're waking up from anesthesia as the general anesthesia is wearing off overwhelms your body's natural anti-pain mechanisms in a way that can contribute to this emergence delirium. This is why, once again, anesthesia is like opening up a book because you in your normal conscious state wouldn't be doing those things. But when you're under the anesthetic altered state of consciousness, it allows for things to be revealed that ordinarily would not be revealed. Uh, Mel, what happens during a medical coma? Does a machine just get set and keep the person in a comatose state? Or does an anesthesiologist have to sit there with them? How long can someone be in one? An anesthesiologist needs to be with you when you are in this medical coma because all of the nerves in your body, not just the nerves I showed you here, the nerves in your brain and your heart are all being turned off to an extent. And when they're being turned off, we need life support in the form of a ventilator, in the, port, in the form of cardiovascular uh, medications that are supporting your blood pressure, your heart rate, et cetera, so that we can mitigate the effects of the anesthetics at too high of a dose your body will eventually turn off in an irreversible fashion. That means one-way street, which we don't want because we want you to wake up. It's good for business and it's good for patients. 
Um, hey, Ruby, thank you for the kind comments. Um, oh, and then by the way, how long can you be under anesthesia in the inter in the intensive care unit? You, have, we have patients in sedated states, not under a full general anesthetic for days at a time. We don't we don't know the longest duration. Um, Soul Glory asks, pardon, Soul Glory asks, why do I shake when I wake up from anesthesia? If you've if had a C-section, often it's that, once again, surge of hormones that overwhelms your body's natural homeostasis. Natural ways of combating, just like how your body has natural ways to combat pain, natural ways to prevent addiction. Well, when you wake up with a sudden surge, in this case of after C-sections, estrogen, progesterone, et cetera, or a rapid, I should say, decrease in those hormonal concentrations, your body invariably shivers, at least in many, not all patients. Ask any woman who's delivered or had a C-section. Now, after general anesthesia, we don't know why, but there is some contribution of the general anesthetic when coming out of the body that causes uncontrollable shivering. We know that meperidine helps. Meperidine is a synthetic opioid, um, at least opioid-like <laughs> medication, it can be very nauseating. So I like to avoid using meperidine when possible, but in the right time, in the right place, it's very powerful. Wes Frater, is a medically induced coma the same as being asleep for surgeries? Yes, it is, um, especially if you're under general anesthesia. Wanda, I'm getting chemo port on Thursday. How long in recovery? Wanda, I hope everyone here sends you positive energy. Positive healing energy. I'm taking a moment to appreciate and recognize your vulnerability and sharing that about you. I hope you the best, the best in recovery. Now, how long that recovery for a chemo port lasts, it's not usually very long for the port itself. Of course, the chemo itself has its own recovery, which is going to be much longer than the port placement itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wes, you're very welcome. Fallen, why do some people have PTSD after trauma? Fallen, PTSD, like any traumatic sequela, well, any traumatic experience can lead to an acute stress disorder. Without the right internal and external support mechanisms, that acute stress disorder, we believe, can then turn into PTSD. Many people have traumatic experiences. I've had them, you've had them. Yet we don't all develop an ASD, acute stress disorder, or PTSD. That's why our self-efficacy, resilience, grit, and then the external compassion, love, support, et cetera, right? Internal and external support, they need to be together in balance to help prevent the brain from malencoding or inappropriately storing this memory of trauma that later turns into these traumatic, relived, disassociative states that cause the pupil dilation, the sweaty palms, et cetera. Very, very good question. I'm so happy that everyone here is sending Wanda positive energy, by the way, for her upcoming chemo port placement, and I anticipate chemo. Brenda says, I had a spinal fusion six months ago with other things to my spin. Had very little discomfort afterwards. How would I start getting pain this much later? Um, I can't comment. Six months after is unlikely to be pain if you didn't have acute pain after the surgery. The transition from acute pain to chronic pain is very real and can be, we believe, prevented by addressing, in large part, cognitive distortions, in particular, catastrophizing, which is, as we've talked about before, a combination of all-or-nothing thinking and uh, fortune-telling or uh, future, -y. oh my gosh, yeah, fortune telling, sorry, that's yeah, exactly what I said. <laughs> Catastrophizing, which is the combination of fortune telling and black and white thinking. We believe that this contributes to the risk of the acute pain after surgery from winding up, causing hypersensitivity, et cetera, that leads, leads to that becoming chronic pain for months after surgery. Uh, Sherry, how do you treat chronic pain associated with depression with ketamine? Sherry, uh, as you know, I also have a ketamine infusion clinic that I direct. I am very passionate about using the right medications at the right time to augment our inner healing potential. And ketamine is a very powerful example of this. When you have a trigger, whether it be 
a particular thought, a particular vision, a particular smell. Gosh, all of these are in the operating room, by the way, but they're also everywhere in life. If we can interrupt the connection in your brain from trigger to central nervous system activation, if we can literally cut that transmission line, it offers a potential to treat that inwardly focused rumination and perseverative loop that we fall into that may underline the depression and might reinforce the PTSD. This is the neuroplasticity effect, we believe, of ketamine, or at least one of the neuroplastic effects can let us form new neural connections that block that trigger from then reliving a traumatic experience that would otherwise strengthen the loop. Hey, if you know, if you know someone, I hope you don't, but if you do know somebody with an opioid addiction, a cocaine addiction, whatever, when you give them, I mean, a gambling addiction, a shopping addiction, a sex addiction, if you give them more of that stimulus, you further enforce that neural connection. That connection is being strengthened. In a previous podcast, we talked about neurons that wire that part of neurons that fire together, wire together. The more you allow these loops to progress, the more deeply entrenched they become. So the more alcohol, typically, the more harder etched, stronger the addiction the more experiences of that PTSD trigger, often the harder to break out of that PTSD because you're enforcing and strengthening that connection. So if ketamine can help by neuroplastically rewire so they're not connected so strongly, we believe that could be a powerful effect. Penmra, I had an infusion in my back. Now there's constant pain in my foot. It's like an electric zap. Penmra, I'm sorry that you've had that. You need to speak with the provider that did the injection. We hope it's not a ridiculous type of pain. Um, inject some common sense. I like your username. This is great. All Are all anesthesiologists educated on EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and mast cell activation disorder, MCAS? Myself and my three kids have had a rough time in the past. Inject some common sense. No, 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 no. Most doctors in the, in the allopathic tradition, certainly when I, I trained at Stanford and Harvard, and I'm so grateful for their education, so grateful for my fantastic advisors and mentors and attending physicians. But no, I didn't get any appreciable training in this. Um, I did from Andrew Weil's fellowship in integrative medicine, but even though it's sorely lacking. So I always take the extra step when I see patients with those conditions that, so that they know that I am aware of it and that we will do everything we can to help the operating room experience not trigger any POTS episodes, MCAS, et cetera. Very important. Uh, thank you for raising awareness. And Diana Collins, uh, a breast cancer survivor. Fantastic to hear, Diana. Thank you for sharing. Lil Miss Jody, may I ask if you've covered somewhere about morphine causing apnea when the patient falls asleep? I had morphine on button during recovery, but kept jolting awake, gasping for breath. Lil Miss Jody, uh, Judy, yes, um, the fentanyl uh, episode that I have, any opioid really, but we've talked about this because opioids depress the central nervous system, particularly the parts of your brain related to breathing as do other anesthetics. So it's not you know, a coincidence that Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, Heath Ledger, I mean, unfortunately there's far too many celebrities, but you know, it's not only celebrities that die from addictions to opioids, many common, far more common people die. Um, the numbers in San Francisco are absolutely staggering, absolutely staggering. Um, and yes, what you experienced is exactly why the one of the, you should know this, you know how patients die with PCA buttons? patient-controlled analgesia. I, I would like someone in the comments to tell me how are patients, what is the most dangerous thing to do for a patient with a button? This is very, very serious. So I'm going to be on the lookout here in the comments and then whoever says it, I'll give a shout out to and tell you this very important PSA that patients don't know about. Um, Heidi, thank you for the kind comments. Caliber, good to see you again. Do you treat out-of-state patients with ketamine? And how often are the treatments? Yes, I do, Caliber. 
Um, we do have patients that come out of state for our ketamine infusion practice. Um, you should watch my other videos specifically for how many sessions, because it depends on every individual. But the average patient, it's once a week for six weeks. But variability, because every patient is different. So Richard Meyer gets the shout out. The family pushes the button. This is heartbreaking. Okay, this is, I've only seen one case of this, thank goodness. But it is one too many, far too many. If a patient has a button that they can press to get intravenous opioids, morphine, like little Miss Judy said, fentanyl, meparidine, Dilaudid, depending on what your hospital has, you press the button, you get a hit, it helps your pain. The idea is that these doses are infrequent enough, small enough, and with a lockout period, so you can't press it like five times back to back, so that you can't overdose. You get enough for your pain because you know if you're in pain, you know to press the button, you can't get too much to overdose. What happens if someone else presses the button? Because a family member is concerned, especially, especially if the patient is sleeping, the family member says, oh my goodness, Johnny looks like they're in pain. Let me press the button for them. And that is an indelible consequence. That is a one-way street that we always educate patients on and educate patients' families on. And it's why we are so afraid of putting PCA buttons in patients' rooms because of that overdose from someone else pressing the button. Is a nerve block permanent? Firstly, lastly, no. Um, we said that they typically last about eight to 24 hours. If it lasts longer than that, one needs to consider that maybe there is some nerve irritation. You should speak with your surgeon about that. Now, uh, I'm going to show you one last nerve block because Laura here was talking about trapezium surgery. So that's in the trapezium in the wrist and the nerve block that I do for that. So this is pretty fun because it's a very safe nerve block and it's a nerve block that does not paralyze the rest of the arm. So I'm going to get uh, my handy dandy ultrasound. This is my phone, by the way. And... I'm going to put this, you can see the goop on here, right? That is ultrasound goop. I'm going to put it on my wrist. Oh, it's frozen. Let's unfreeze that. Okay. Okay. So we get a little bit more of that ultrasound goop. I'm not going to do the nerve lock on myself, uh, but I will do a demo of what that nerve looks like. We're going to hit the radian nerve and the median nerve. That's typically what I do for that surgery. I'm trying to juggle a couple of things here. So thank you for your patience. Okay, so you can see this is my wrist on the ultrasound. Ta-da! Does everyone see the artery there in the top of the screen that's pulsating? The little guy. Let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Okay. That guy's my radial artery right there. The little guy, it's pulsating. I'll put some color on it so you can really see it. It's adorable little, uh, adorable little artery. See that there? That's my radial artery pulsating in red. Does everyone see that? Now, there is a nerve just lateral to it called the radian nerve. You can actually, a radial nerve, you can see it there. It's very, very small, but I inject about three to five cc's of Novocaine-like medication there for your trapezium surgery. Notice I'm injecting it on your wrist, uh, forearm, distal forearm. Last one I'm gonna show you is the median nerve. Let me take the Doppler off. The median nerve, like when they, when they you know when you have carpal tunnel syndrome? The median nerve is being entrapped. I'm going to put the median nerve in the center of this ultrasound for you. And uh, where is it? That guy right there. Oh, that guy that's got the little pokey things in it, the little holes in it. Sorry. That's my median nerve. I deposit. It's right in the middle of the screen there. If you can see that. Right in the middle of the screen. Yeah, there you go, right in the middle. That is my median nerve. That's what gets entrapped when you have carpal tunnel syndrome. 
and three to five cc's there. One last thing I'm going to show you because uh, medicine is cool and because anesthesiologists need to be jack of all trades here. Uh, I'm going to show you my heart. Do you guys want to see a quick view of my heart, by the way, before we... Oh, hey, Beverly even said, I have seen my heart ultrasound before. Well, let me show you my heart ultrasound. Um, you might find it fascinating. And of course, now that I want to do it live. Oh, here we go. Now it's letting me do it. I already got ultrasound goop on my wrist and my neck. What's one more spot on my heart? So I wore loose fitting clothing for a reason. Left side of my body. I'm going to come back down here. You're going to see. That's my heart right there. Look at that guy. Now, <laughs> you can see my aortic valve and my mitral valve there. And watch it. If I, my breathing is going to actually influence what you see there. Watch this. One, two, three. Look at how much I can modulate the heart rate with my breathing alone. I did a little mini Valsalva there for you. So this is what we call a, a um, long axis view of the heart. I'm ultrasounding myself right there. <laughs> so we have to look at this when you're under anesthesia to make sure there isn't a breakdown or a compromised flow of blood through those valves to make sure that, remember, if you're having a heart attack, if you're having chest pain or trouble breathing, we can't ask you when you're unconscious. We need to look objectively with the ultrasound. And that's why this little probe that I connect to my Samsung phone is quite incredible, is it not? But like I said, I'm not advertising it. I won't even tell you the brand name because you know that I'm here for you to be empowered with knowledge so you can advocate for yourself. If you appreciated me coming on on this Sunday afternoon, please leave a uh, like, share what you learned with others. Subscribe if you haven't. Your support helps me do this more often for you without having to potentially disempower you with external low side of control in the form of shady supplements. That's often what they are. Not always, but often. So until next time, thank you.